The design of a study is an extremely important part of doing research. The study design is essentially a blueprint for the collection, measurement, and analysis of the data. It is often argued that the design of a study is more important than the analysis of the results, because if the study design is poor, then the study may not be able to achieve its objective at all, whereas if the study is poorly analyzed, the data can be reanalyzed to reach meaningful conclusions. Different study designs are needed to answer different research questions. The purpose of this lecture is to describe several common types of observational study designs in public health. The material for this lecture was developed by Ian Brearley and Laura Lay at the University of Minnesota's Department of Biostatistics. I am presenting this lecture with their permission. Brearley and Lay adapted the taxonomy developed by Grimms and Schultz to illustrate a few common study designs used in medical and public health research. Research designs can be divided into two broad categories, observational studies and experimental studies. In an observational study, the researcher does, does not assign exposures to participants. The exposure is the agent under investigation that is thought to be related to the outcome being measured. In other words, the explanatory variable. I will use the word exposure throughout to refer to the explanatory variable as it is commonly used in public health. For example, we may be interested in exposure to heavy metals and its relationship with sinus cancer. Or we may be interested in exposure to repeated cell phone use and its relationship with brain tumors. In all these examples, the exposure is not, or cannot be, assigned by the researcher for practical or ethical reasons. Examples of observational studies include case series studies, cross-sectional studies, case control studies, and longitudinal or cohort, cohort studies. And in an experimental study, the researcher assigns exposures, often called treatments, in the setting to participants. For example, we may be interested in the relationship of the latrial treatment and human cancer, or we may be interested in the relationship between regular aspirin use and heart attack or death. In these examples, the researcher can decide which participants will receive which treatment, treatments. Several subtypes of experimental studies can be defined by whether they include a comparison group or not, or whether they randomly assign the participants to the exposure or not. Today I will discuss observational studies, and next class I will cover experimental studies. A case series study is an observational study in which a series of participants are observed and the course of their disease or other participant characteristics and outcomes are described. It is similar to a report on a single case, but it describes more than one related case. Case studies, case series studies, typically involve a small number of participants. There is no comparison group. There is no sampling. Case series studies are purely descriptive. No information about the association between the exposure and the outcome can be obtained, and no inference can be made to a larger population. Case series studies are typically not planned in advance, but arise due to a researcher or a doctor noticing something unusual or unexpected. Publication of observations from a case series may lead to research questions for more rigorously designed studies. Here is an example of a case series study. In 1981, Michael Goldlib and his colleagues at the UCLA School of Medicine reported a rare form of pneumonia and unusual multiple viral infections in four previously healthy young men. Part of the abstract for this landmark paper is shown here. Other similar case series studies followed, and by 1982, the condition was named Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome now commonly known as AIDS. The main advantage of case series studies is that they can be comparatively easy and inexpensive. They are useful as a descriptive tool and can also be useful in designing further studies to provide a better quality of evidence. The disadvantages to case series studies include no comparison group. The sample consists of either only exposed participants with the outcome or all persons with the outcome. As a result, it is not possible to determine whether there is an association between exposure and outcome, nor to assess whether there might be a cause and effect relationship between exposure and outcome. Another disadvantage is that this type of design is usually retrospective, due to the typical unplanned nature of the study. This can result in problems due to the use of historical data.
A cross-sectional study is an observational study in which data are collected from participants at a single point in time. This provides a snapshot in time of the characteristics of interest. Data for cross-sectional studies are often collected using surveys or polls and can involve a large number of participants. The participants may or may not be randomly selected from the population of interest. The collected data could include outcome variables of interest, such as disease status, diagnostic test results, or biomarker levels. The data could also inclu uh, include possible explanatory variables, such as exposures to suspected risk factors. Finally, the data could include demographic characteristics, such as age, gender, or ethnicity. All of these variables are collected at the same time. The collected data can be used to explore relationships between variables at a single point in time. Cross-sectional study designs are used in prevalence studies to evaluate the prevalence of risk factors or the prevalence of a disease or condition in a given population at a certain time. For example, researchers used a cross-sectional study to measure the prevalence of serious eye disease in a North London elderly population in 1998. They can also be used repeatedly to monitor changes in the prevalence of a condition over time. An example of this was a prevalent study of skull fractures in children admitted to a hospital in Edinburgh from 1983 to 1989. Although the study period was seven years, the information about each subject was recorded at a single point in time, which makes it a cross-sectional study. Cross-sectional studies are also used to identify associations between a condition and potential risk factors. These associations can be further explored in future, more rigorous studies. An example of this type of use of a cross-sectional design is a study that administered a questionnaire to elderly people to explore the relationship between alcohol consumption and emergency room visits. Cross-sectional studies are also used to establish norms for diagnostic or screening tests, to compare the agreement between a new test and an established test, or to compare the sensitivity and specificity of a test to the known gold standard diagnosis. An example of this was a study that compared the accuracy of detecting gonorrhea in women between self-taken swab and clinically taken swab cultures. The major advantage of a cross-sectional studies is that they can be comparatively quick and inexpensive. There is no follow-up of participants, so, no fewer resource, so fewer resources are required to carry out the study. Another advantage is that they are useful for identifying potential relationships that can then be studied more rigorously using a cohort or experimental study design. There are three main disadvantages to cross-sectional studies. The first is that cross-sectional studies do not provide any support for cause and effect relationships between variables. Since the data are collected at a single point in time, it is not possible to determine whether exposure to a risk factor preceded the outcome of interest. Cross-sectional data give no information about the disease process or natural history. The second disadvantage is that rare diseases or conditions can't efficiently be studied because there may be no one with the condition, even in large samples. The last disadvantage is the potential for bias in survey data. There may be volunteer basis, bias, excuse me, in a study where the participants are selected by volunteering, as in a radio call-in show, for example, those who volunteer may be different in some ways from those who do not volunteer. The volunteers are a self-selected, non-random sample, which may not be representative of the population of interest. There may also be non-response bias. In a survey that uses random sampling, some of the randomly chosen subjects may refuse to participate in the study. The non-responders may differ from the responders in some way, resulting in a sample which is not representative of the population of interest. Non-response bias is considered a particular problem if a large percentage of those contacted refuse to participate. A case control study is an observational study in which participants are selected based on their disease status. Cases are people who already have the disease or condition of interest. Controls are individuals from a similar population who do not have the disease or condition. The cases and controls may or may not be randomly selected. Researchers then look backward in time for past exposures to suspected risk factors that might have resulted in the condition. Past exposures may be ascertained from interviews with, with the participants themselves, from interviews with family members, particularly if the participant is deceased, or from medical records.
Case control studies are often called retrospective studies because the outcome already occurred before the participant was included in the study. Case control studies are useful for exploring the relationship between a disease or some other outcome and possible risk factors, especially if the disease is rare. An example of a case control study is an investigation into the potential association between cell phone use and brain tumors published in 2001 in the New England Journal of Medicine. The researchers identified 782 people with various types of tumors, the cases, and 799 people with various non-malignant conditions, the controls. They assessed exposure to cell phone use by interviewing the participants. They did not find any evidence for an association between cell phone use and brain tumors. Case control studies are invaluable for studying rare diseases because you can obtain an adequate number of cases for the study and you have to wait you have to wait for the condition or disease and you excuse me and and you uh, because you can obtain an adequate number of cases for the study and not have to wait for the condition or disease to occur as you would in prospective studies they are also relatively quick and inexpensive in, to, in comparison to prospective studies however case control studies have a number of disadvantages the first is that case control studies do not provide any evidence for cause and effect relationships between variables. In many cases, it is not possible to determine whether exposure to a risk factor preceded the outcome of interest. Case control data also give no information about the disease process or natural history. Another disadvantage is the potential for bias. One potential source of bias is misclassification bias, which occurs when a case is misclassified as a control or vice versa. It isn't always easy to determine disease status. Misclassifying a case or a control may result in a biased, inaccurate measure of association. Another potential source of bias is recall bias. People do not always accurately remember their exposure history, and cases may be more likely than controls to remember exposure to something they believe may have caused their disease. They also may result in, biased, in a biased measure of association. Another disadvantage is that case control studies cannot be used to estimate the prevalence of a disease or condition in the population. The ratio of cases to controls is chosen in advance by the researcher. Common ratios are one control for every one case, or two controls for every one case. If a ratio of one to one is used, then half of the study sample will be cases and half will be controls. This does not mean that the prevalence of the disease in that population is 50%. The proportion of cases in the study sample is not a measure of the prevalence of the disease in the population. A final disadvantage is that selection of appropriate controls can be difficult. The ideal control subject is a person who is identical in every possible way to the case subject except that they do not have the disease of interest. This situation cannot be perfectly obtained in real life. A cohort study is an observational study in which a group of participants, a cohort, is followed over time to determine how many develop the disease or condition of interest. For this reason, cohort studies are sometimes called follow-up studies or longitudinal studies. The study participants may or may not be randomly selected. All participants in a cohort study are initially healthy in the sense that they do not yet have the outcome of interest, for example, a primary heart attack. Members of the cohort may be classified as exposed or unexposed to one or more risk factors at the beginning of the study. For example, study participants could be identified as smokers and non-smokers, or as overweight and normal weight. Both the exposed and the unexposed participants in the cohort are followed over time, and the incidence of the disease or condition of interest in each group is determined. Cohort studies are useful for exploring the relationship between risk factors and disease. Most cohort studies are prospective or forward-looking. In a prospective cohort study, the exposure has already occurred, but the outcome has not yet happened. The risk factor exposure is determined in the present when the participants are enrolled in the study and information about the outcome is collected at a future time after the specified length of follow-up. Cohort studies can also be retrospective or backward-looking. In a retrospective cohort study, both the exposure and the outcome have already occurred. 
Historical records, such as medical records, are used to assess the risk factor exposure at some point in the past, say, for example, in 1950. The historical records are then used to follow the participants forward over time and collect information about the outcome after the specified length of follow-up time, say, for example, in 1970, after 20 years of follow-up. Retrospective studies are also called historical cohort studies. They require complete and accurate historical medical records. In both prospective and retrospective cohort studies, though, the participants are initially healthy. They do not yet have the disease or condition of interest. An example of a prospective cohort study is the Nurses' Health Study. It was started in 1976 and is now in the third generation of the study with over 275,000 participants. The participants fill out a questionnaire once every two years. The original goal of the study was to investigate the risk factors for major chronic diseases in women. The most current study includes both men and women from a variety of health-related fields and examines how dietary patterns, lifestyle, environment, and nursing occupational exposures impact their health. A major advantage of cohort studies, compared to other observational studies, is that they can provide evidence for possible cause and effect relationships between exposures and outcomes. This is because in a cohort study, exposure to the risk factors always precedes the outcome of interest, thereby avoiding the debate about which is cause and which is effect. Cohort studies can also provide information about the disease process or natural history. Cohort studies have a number of disadvantages, however. The major disadvantage is that they tend to involve large number of participants over multiple sites and may involve follow-up times of years or decades and can therefore be time-consuming and expensive. Another major disadvantage is that the, follow, the long follow-up times can result in a large number of participants dropping out or being lost to follow-up, which can introduce bias. Another disadvantage is that cohort designs are not suitable for very rare outcomes. If the outcome is extremely rare, then an extremely large cohort will need to be followed in order to obtain enough outcome events. This is prohibitively expensive. Retrospective cohort studies, as mentioned previously, cannot be conducted at all unless complete and accurate medical records covering the full time period of interest are available. A last disadvantage is the potential for selection bias. That is, obtaining a sample that is not represented, representative of the population of interest. For example, the researchers from the original nurses' health study wanted to make inferences about women in general. However, their sample only contained women who were nurses, and we should not presume that women nurses are representative of all women. In the next lecture, we will, discover, I mean, we will discuss experimental designs, where the investigator controls some aspects of the intervention.